been, most of the people involved in that were doing it because they felt that white kids learned different ways than black kids. So it was mm. black kids are just as smart as rich kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I had that we had to kind of flub with. When you say something like that, and you see that happening right now, a lot of people, activists right now, are saying, oh, we need to have separate black only spaces because there's a different way of learning, not just a different way of knowing between women and men. But they say, oh, black people learn in different places. We need extra attention for black people. We need right. them to be taught by certain people Can own, are the only ones that can teach certain information to certain groups of people. Those things are coming from good places. I disagree with most of them, but I do understand different people learn in different ways. But yeah. that is why I'm arguing for using the current technology that we have to get it down to an individual level because it's not different classes of people. It's different cases, different individuals within classes yeah. learn in different ways. So, yeah. Yeah. So the authors say here, I, I like how they sum up what the book is covering. They say universities problems are deep and fundamental. Most academic marketing is semi-fraudulent. Rating is largely nonsense. Students don't learn or study much. Students cheat frequently. Liberal arts education fails because it presumes a false theory of learning. Professors and administrators waste students' money and time in order to line their own pockets. Everyone engages in self-righteous moral grandstanding to disguise their selfish cronyism. Professors pump out unemployable graduates into over oversaturated academic job markets for self-serving reasons and so on. So again, a as damning as what I just said was, we're still going to make the case. This is not being done out of malice. This is the result of the incentives set up by the institutions, which have all these negative externalities, which everyone else bears out. It's not like the professors and administrators are all colluding to make these bad things happen. Yeah. And this is a cascade thing. You know, yeah. one person makes a decision between two things and then two people base their decision based off of what that first person did. That might have been the less positive of the two options. Then two more people come and based off of those two people, then that's four decisions and it goes to 16. And then exponentially this grows over time and spreads out. And then you have entire institutions. Like yeah. when you're talking about institutional racism, institutional uh, police and violence and things like this in the 1619 Project and critical theory, the idea of something being institutional is not what we're against. We are completely for that. That is part of why we're talking about this. But we're not saying it's inherently done that way for evil reasons, even if mm -hmm. we disagree with what it actually is. Uh, yes. So the short the short of it is that bad incentives explain bad behavior, and the authors have a few examples here. Which, as the book as we progress with going through the book, there's going to be more things like this. But just this just to sort of give you a foreshadowing of what we're going to be talking about. So the Jason he had a tough instance at his school where they had to hire a new professor, and they were torn between a man who was more qualified and a woman who was less qualified. Now. The provost was told by the upper administrators, look, we need more women and minorities. Our department is mostly white men. We need more diversity. We, we, we just need more diversity in the department. Now, the provost was stuck in a very tough spot here, and here's why. If he had hired the man, the department could be charged with what's called disparate impact. That is, you didn't specifically discriminate against anyone, but people can look at your department and say, you don't have enough minorities and women here, and then... That, and then that shows some sort of institutional prejudice and you're working to keep minorities and women out. So that could open up a lawsuit that way. Now, the, the that was sort of the rock. Now, the hard place is that if they had hired the woman who was less qualified, that could they could actually be sued under for the well, for the reason that they're giving preferential treatment. Now, preferential treatment in line with the Civil Rights Act is only allowed if the university has an affirmative action plan in place, which they did not. So. If they had hired a less qualified woman, the man could say, well, wait a minute, I'm being turned down because of my sex, and then he could launch a lawsuit. So they were stuck in this really weird spot where, again, it's like, which way do you go? Now, what ended up happening in this scenario was that the man and woman were both offered the job. The man ended up taking it, and the woman turned it down. Now, so it worked out better for everyone because they got the more qualified candidate, and the woman just said, no, I'm not interested and went somewhere else. So – in the long run, it worked out well for everyone. But the concern is that the way the law is set up, it, it could have created this really tough situation, which could have, which could have caused problems, however it went. But but that's not the result of the university. It's the law creating those incentives. Any comments or yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah. yeah, two things based on this yeah. one. First of all, with just the law itself, this is more evidence yeah. that mm -hmm. the law itself is at best a 
codification of some of the ethics of any given group, but it has almost nothing to do with morality. Like it's just it's just yeah. things that people kind of agree with. It does not define morality. So people should be like, oh, this law is this way. That's so horrible. Slavery was once once upon a time a one hundred percent legal in pretty much every system of law in the world. So that should that should disabuse you of that idea of connecting morality with the law. And then now when you talk about the specific laws here, what are schools about? What are educational institutions about? What do people decide? Why do they decide to go to certain schools versus other ones? What are people selling? What is the product that they're offering there? What we're talking about, what Stephen and I are focusing on, what we are for is the conveyance of information that somebody does not know to be known to somebody after someone is convinced. And it's not a simple thing. We're, we're currently doing a re-recording of this actual thing right now. I'm kind of, some of my mind is thinking, was the first time I said this a better way? Can I say these kind of convey these things in a better way this time? We've been doing this conversation series. We're talking behind the scenes of how can we better do this? How can we make this to be something where, let alone, not only the information we're saying, but actually to get people to even sit down and actually decide to spend the time to even actually choose to listen to this. There's different ways you can do it. Do other languages. There's, there's all these kind of things. But when you talk about this, why is a school deciding between these two things, why are those things that they're worrying about actual legal, actual ramifications for, instead of literally saying, we are an institution that gives information to students, and we're worried that if the students find out that we decided to not hire the person, the mm-hmm. individual that was literally better at conveying information, they can sue us. That, to me, when you're an institution of learning, should be the only legal thing involved in that whole thing. That should be the only deciding factor. Is this person better at teaching? Then hire them. It shouldn't matter what they have between their legs. It shouldn't matter their XXXY chromosome, the kind of curliness of their hair, the accent they have, the, the, the number of limbs that work. It's, all these things should, shouldn't matter. They, they, you could you could have specific situations where maybe there's very specific things to that, but if that doesn't factor in, if, as you said, on whatever actual qualifications thing they've actually said when it comes to teaching itself, this one individual who happens to be male, had been found, happens to be male, happens to be white, had been found to be better, I want an institution, I want a world where that's what decides why people are employed. Or if you have a situation where people decide to go with those affirmative action type of things like companies and things have now, let them be open about it. And I'll go to the company and associate with the companies who are deciding it on merit that is completely directed to the product. Because you see that. And in the market, there might be some kind of way where there might be some benefit shown where if you just have social justice, human resource, like identity hiring type of things, there might be some hidden benefit that I am not aware of that might be able to be gotten by someone. So go ahead and do that. But I would, I'd rather just more information and be more open with that whole situation. But yeah. And the thing is, too, contrary to what Tara B. said in that comment, the author specifically said, we don't take a stance on affirmative action either way. They said, we're not saying, oh, they should have hired the woman because women are an oppressed class. They didn't say, no, we're mer- we just want meritocracy to hire the man. They said, we're not taking a position here. We're just laying out what are the incentives based on what the law is and how do universities have to deal with it. That's all they're saying. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's one of the weird things that happens with this that I'm trying to get a better understanding of is how people jump and conflate things as descriptive to prescriptive to applications. Like things are like information is what it is. Like the truth yeah. is what's true. It's not my truth. It's not Stephen's no. truth. It's not the author's truth. These are either true things. Like yeah. then the next reading is human action and it's gonna be a great reading. We're going chapter to chapter with that one. Where he's talking about with history. There is no opinions in history. <laughs> There's yeah. no editorializing in history. Something either historically happened or it did not happen. Thank you for listening. This has been a clip from an actual longer recording that I'll try to leave a link to on the screen or somewhere around here where you're listening to this. Presents. <laughs> Presents. Presents. <laughs> Clinton. Peasants. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay.